Tactical nuclear warfare at sea. You can see on the uh, right a French sea launch ballistic missile launch, and on the left you can see a French MSBS M20 SLBM. So tactical naval power. Modern naval combat since the 1960s is based on the missile, nuclear weapons, and electronic detection, and therefore much of the combat is beyond the horizon. This is a, a Soviet Kuznetsov aircraft carrier, which is still in use with the Russian Navy. There are three key platforms of modern naval warfare. All naval weapon systems have a nuclear equivalent. The first platform is air power, in the form of fast-moving strike aircraft, long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft, as depicted here, and helicopters. Weapons include uh, surface-to-air missiles with ranges of 10 to 100 kilometers, air-to-air -air missiles from other aircraft with ranges of up to 200 kilometers. Here you can see on the left a Soviet Aleutian 38 May with a magnetic anomaly detector, which is the extended tail at the back of the aircraft. That is a magnet which detects uh, metal submarine hulls uh, several hundred meters below uh, on, under the water because uh, magnetic effects actually do uh, transmit through water. So it's able to prosecute an attack if it passes immediately above a submarine. On the right are NATO Lulu nuclear depth charges. This is a, a US Forestall uh, aircraft carrier with a variety of different kinds of aircraft that we're going to look at in a moment. A typical Nimitz class carrier carries 90 aircraft. This is the F-14. It's the principal uh, interceptor. It uh, is a uh, very uh, long-range aircraft uh, designed principally to shoot down very large and very fast Soviet cruise missiles like the Kangaroo and to intercept uh, backfire bombers. It is no longer in service and in the simulation you're going to play its role has been replaced by F-18s. This is the F-18. It can attack both ground targets, ship targets, and attack other aircraft. It's got a very a variety of payloads. This is the E-2C, Airborne Early Warning Aircraft. It's the most important aircraft on an aircraft carrier. They typically carry three or four. They're basically aircraft with radars on top. They fly to high altitude, not on top of the aircraft carrier, because they don't want to give away where the aircraft carrier is. And then they coordinate all of the interceptions against incoming missiles and incoming enemy aircrafts. This is the S-3. Its primary role as a jet aircraft and long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft is to hunt submarines. It can also fire anti-ship missiles against ships. It has a large payload of sunaboys, which are microphones that are dropped in the water. This is an A6. It's an anti-ship aircraft. It can carry uh, nuclear bombs as well as harpoons to blow up enemy ships. This is the EA6, which is an electronic warfare version of the A6. It basically jams and... This is the Canadian Bonaventure aircraft carrier with its aircraft flying overhead. The Canadian Navy's mission was primarily escort at sea in order to resupply Europe and any other areas that would have been attacked by the Soviets. And the Bonaventure carried helicopters that could be used against submarines. This is the Canadian aircraft carrier Bonaventure battle group with its escorts and supply ships. This is the Canadian Bonaventure with its helicopters and aircraft. So this is the vaunted aircraft I told you about before, the Tupolev 26 Backfire Bomber. It was supersonic, had incredible range, and had a payload of anti-ship missiles that were supersonic. The F-14's mission was to stop this aircraft. This aircraft was the biggest threat to the US aircraft carrier forces. Uh, even with the rise of China, they still don't possess an equivalent aircraft, and it may take them some years to do it. The Soviets had over a hundred aircraft like this that they could move from airfield to airfield on their littoral, threatening the US Navy from as far as the Pacific to as far as the Mediterranean and the Arctic. This aircraft could take off in the Ukraine or Sevastopol, fire its missiles in the Black Sea, 
And the missiles, which had incredible range, could fly over Turkey and then hit U.S. aircraft carriers in the eastern Mediterranean. So the logic is to protect your carrier group with aircrafts uh, and radars from ships to detect incoming attackers. So, different components of the battle group. You'd have the aircraft carrier in the center. You'd have various uh, aircraft with radars protecting it. They would send out helicopters and the S-3 aircraft to chase enemy submarines. Occasionally, you'd get information from satellites on the location of enemy ships. And then you'd have your other aircraft operating. Here's your airborne early warning aircraft. You'd have your other aircraft operating, intercepting incoming enemy aircraft. The aircraft carrier itself is vulnerable but it has a very large number of aircraft that are able to reach out farther than, than the ability of a ship to fire missiles. The second platform are ships. These includes, include surface combatants, aircraft carriers, support vessels, and transports. Their weapons include aircraft or helicopters to surface missiles, ship guns, submarine torpedoes, and aircraft bombs. This here is the U.S. Navy Truxton Cruiser. This is the U.S. Aegis Cruiser. It's the core ship of a U.S. battle group that protects an aircraft carrier. Aegis refers to the computer system that the cruiser uses. The Aegis system uses phased array radars, which you can see here on various parts of the ship, and it combines together the entire air defense, anti-submarine and anti-ship defenses of the flotilla. So you have a central coordinating station that operates all of the individual ships as a single unit. This is the Soviet Kirov nuclear battle cruiser. It was about the largest cruiser in the world. It had a large array of missile launchers that you can see depicted here. These are the missiles that it carried. 20 SSN-19 nuclear warhead shipwreck missiles and 12 SAN-6 surface-to-air missiles, all very large missiles. On the left, we see the launch from the U.S. Navy ship of an anti-ship missile, Tomahawk. On the right side, we see the launch of the standard Western anti-ship missile, the Harpoon. There are a variety of other missiles, the Exocet, the Penguin, but this is the most widely used anti-ship missile in the world, mostly by Western allies. It's constantly being upgraded. It's essentially a cruise missile, but it's got good range and a very smart guidance system. This is the Soviet SSC-1B Sapal Coastal Defense Missile, nuclear capable. The third platform are submarines, including ballistic missile submarines and hunter-killers. Weapons include helicopters, aircraft dropped um, uh, bombs, submarines, or ship torpedoes. You can see on the left the Soviet Akula nuclear hunter-killer submarine. It's the fastest submarine in the world. On the right is the Shkval anti-ship missile. It's not really a torpedo. It's thought that it was a problem with this device that caused the Soviet Oscar-class Kursk submarine to have a, an explosion and sink off the coast of Norway. The Shkval is short range. It requires a submarine to get very close to its target. What the Shkval does is it emits from its nose a bubble of gas so this, rather than moving at the speed of a torpedo, which is maybe 30 knots or 40 knots, which is about 80 kilometers an hour, this moves at several hundred kilometers an hour because the bubble of gas allows the rocket to move, move frictionlessly without pressure through the water. So it moves at the speed of a rocket underwater, which is fairly remarkable. It just doesn't have much range. This is the United States Navy SSN-21 Seawolf, which is their more sophisticated hunter-killer submarine. This is the People's Liberation Army, Dang Gikyu, Zia class Project 092, which has since been replaced. And you can see a Jin class uh, submarine deployed in the picture in the center, and the Jin class submarine deployed in the Google satellite view. You can see here a Zia-class Chinese ballistic missile submarine, which is no longer operational on the right, and on the left is the Soviet Typhoon ballistic missile submarine, the largest submarine ever built. 
Here is the Typhoon overlaid over a football field showing its vertical launch missiles as well as its torpedoes. This is the Soviet Agma transport which carried extra sea launch ballistic missiles for ballistic missile submarines. Below is a picture of the People's Liberation Army Navy, Chinese, submarine base at Jiangzhe Zhejuan. Here is depicted the Arctic bastions for the Soviet ballistic missile submarines. Here and here. And here is the Soviet bastion in the Sea of Okhotsk. This is a Soviet Oscar nuclear guided submarine. Its principal purpose was to destroy aircraft carriers. It carried a large number of missiles and torpedoes and was the second largest submarine in the world. You could see below a recent piece of propaganda by Putin, which they deliberately showed to the press of a nuclear torpedo going to a city. As mentioned earlier, this was investigated in the late 40s, early 50s, when in the Tizard report they investigated the effects of nuclear torpedoes on port facilities, and it was discovered the effect was not significant. If a port gets destroyed in, say, the United States, they're obviously going to blame the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union will suffer retaliation. Having a torpedo approach a port and it blow up by surprise uh, is not going to achieve much plausible deniability. Types of anti-submarine warfare. Typically, you have rocket launch torpedoes. You could fire a rocket where you think a submarine is, and when the rocket gets over the submarine, it'll drop a torpedo in the water, which will then begin a search pattern. You have towed sonar arrays, which listen for submarines. They can be passive, listening, or active, where they go ping. There are anti-submarine warfare helicopters that carry the Son of Boys and the torpedoes and the depth charges. There are underwater acoustics and sea mines that can listen to submarines. There are satellite surveillance that can spot submarines if they're close to the surface from their periscope. There are hunter-killer submarines and, of course, maritime patrol aircraft. You can see pictured here a Sea King anti-submarine warfare helicopter with a wire dropping a son of boy into the water, uh, a, dipping, an, a, a dipping microphone. Um, in the bottom left you can see a Soviet nuclear depth charge. This is the Soviet helicopter class carrier, the Kiev. You can see uh, the front and the back. Its mission was to hunt NATO submarines. Specifically, these were used to protect the Soviet ballistic missile bastions against surface attacks against uh, the Soviet uh, submarine fleets. On top is the Royal Navy Nimrod Maritime Surveillance Aircraft, and you can see the magnetic anomaly detector protruding at the back. Below is the United States Navy P-3 Orion Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft, again with the mutually anomaly detector. Both of these carried nuclear depth charges and nuclear torpedoes. To the left is a Soviet ASROC. An ASROC is a rocket that carries a nuclear torpedo. So it's an SSN-10 nuclear SSN-15 missile. On the right is a U.S. Navy ASROC. These are two pictures of the U.S. Navy SUBROC. A sub-rock is a nuclear as-rock. In other words, it's a rocket launched from the torpedo tubes that flies to a location that it's suspected another submarine is located. The rocket then ejects a torpedo that begins a search pattern underwater. This is the nuclear version of the 1963 missile. It has a range of 56 kilometers. The detection of the enemy is typically made by passive sonar. So you listen carefully and by sound waves bouncing off the thermocline, which is the cold layer in the water above the submarine, and uh, sound waves bouncing off the bottom of the ocean, you can figure out where the enemy submarine is. This is a launch of the U.S. sub in 1963. This is the detonation of a nuclear sub in the water. You can see just the tip of a ship to the right. This is a 1955 detonation of an ASROC at a 10 kilometer distance from this aircraft carrier. 
In principle, naval warfare is a harsher variant of the principles of war, in particular, the concentration of force. While command and control is easier, there is no less friction because standards must therefore be higher for victory. Results in naval warfare occur very quickly. The key to victory in naval operations is the application of the offense, the destruction of the enemy. Here you can see a Wii Seawiz, a close-in weapon system, which fires thousands of bullets in a second in order to create a wall of lead to intercept missiles just before they're about to impact, about 100 meters off either side of a ship. It was the absence of this system which, result, which caused so many British ships to be damaged and sunk in the Falklands War. The importance of reconnaissance. A key aspect of naval warfare is scouting and detection sensors because uh, jamming center sensors and counter uh, scouting techniques keeps the enemy from seeing you. In naval warfare, surprise is devastating. This is especially true of nuclear weapons at sea. It should be noted that if you have sensors, powerful radars, you should never turn them on. If you turn on a radar, your ships that are emitting the radar will be seen for thousands of nautical miles. Typically, you should use aircraft and their sensors to detect ships. You only turn on ship radars if the ship has already been detected, particularly radars that allow detection of aircraft and missiles so you can shoot them down. Your interception of incoming missiles by your own missiles will not work if your radar is not on. So you can deploy picket ships out in front who do have radars on, but they are, if they're fast enough and they can um, uh, basically move, um, they can turn off their radars and then engage in evasion, which will increase their chance of not being hit by an incoming missile. So. Typically, ships only turn on the radars once they've been detected, even though the radar is incredibly powerful. Aircraft should be used instead. So passive sensors have a much longer range than active sensors. So sensors that detect if sensors are on have a much greater range than sensors that are, that are actively turned on, like radar. This is the US E-2C Hawkeye Airborne Early Warning Aircraft, and it's the most important aircraft on an aircraft carrier because this aircraft can see what's happening. So it must be flown very high at maximum altitude, because the higher you are, the greater distance you can see around the curvature of the Earth. This is a Soviet surveillance trawler. It's basically a spy ship. Today, the People's Republic of China employs several hundred of these. This is the effect of a nuclear weapon on ship survival. What we have on the left-hand side is the effect of damage on a ship. What we have on the top horizontal is the size of the bomb. So let's examine a 20 kiloton device. A 20 kiloton device will destroy all ships within two square kilometers. It'll disable temporarily all ships within seven. Basically damage them, damage the rudder, damage the propeller, damage the ship enough so it's immobile temporarily. And then within 13 kilometers, it'll blow the sensitive antenna and radars off the surface of the ship and damage its weapons, requiring repairs. You can see that when you get up to a 20 megaton device, you're going to be severely damaging every ship for 1,257 square kilometers, which is a very large area. So just like on land, in modern flotillas, you do not have dense ships. In a nuclear environment, ships are incredibly dispersed you have typically six ships per 400 square kilometers. That's a very low density. The ships cannot even see each other. This is the US nuclear subsurface detonation among test ships, some American, mostly Japanese, at the end of World War II. This is the USS aircraft carrier Saratoga, 400 meters from the detonation of the nuclear blast on the Baker test. And you can see the Central Island building has been knocked over. The ship sank shortly thereafter. NATO's strategy. NATO's strategy is the threat to lose control. Otherwise, there is perfect stability and there's no deterrent against the fear of escalation of nuclear war. This is the stability-instability paradox. Without this, the Soviet Union would attack, knowing that nuclear weapons would keep NATO from using nuclear weapons. The consequences of nuclear detonations at sea are far less than on land in an apparent sense. At sea, it kills fish without any collateral human damage. This tempts states to make use of nuclear weapons at sea much earlier than making use of nuclear weapons on land. 
Because of the underwater amplification of the shock waves, nuclear weapons are especially useful against submarines. A 10 kiloton weapon will destroy a submarine within 2 kilometers of its position. The sea lines of communications are vital for NATO. Once a war broke out in different parts of the world, NATO would have to resupply those with transports. NATO would therefore need to attack Soviet submarines, while Soviet submarines with nuclear weapons would try to intercept the convoys. A major target of nuclear weapons would be coastal bases, and this is one of the ways that nuclear weapons at sea could spread inland. If nuclear weapons are being used between submarines and transport convoys, and some aircraft were deployed from bases chasing and nuking the submarines, then the submarines might decide to fire nuclear missiles at the bases, and so nuclear war would spread from the sea to the land. You can see here the different U.S. fleets and their associated bases around the world. This is the Soviet Murmansk naval base. You can see where the Kursk accident occurred off the coast. These sites could be destroyed, would have been destroyed if a nuclear war had occurred. These are the reaches of maritime surveillance aircraft and subsurface surveillance systems. NATO was always waiting for a large surge of Soviet submarines moving into the Atlantic. This was taken as a signal that the Soviets would invade Western Europe because the submarines would be in the Atlantic to stop the U.S. from resupplying their forces in NATO. The U.S. could fly aircraft and fly soldiers to Europe, but the tanks could be brought only by ship in large numbers. Here we can see where the Soviet ballistic missile submarines would have been deployed. up here in the Barents Sea. Now if the Soviets wanted to deploy submarines in the Atlantic, they would have had to come down to here and here. And there, there was constant surveillance, even in peacetime, of underground uh, listening systems, as well as patrols, as well as ships. The listening system was called SOSUS. The Soviets had, at the height of the Cold War, 400 submarines, which is an enormous number far more than China has today, which is about 60. So NATO would have had to uh, trip down those submarines in order to keep the transports going uh, across the Atlantic. Furthermore, the NATO aircraft carrier force would have gone up the coast of Norway to the Barents Sea to attack the ballistic missile submarine bastion that the Soviets had deployed north of the Kola Peninsula, opposite Murmansk. The red arrow is the direction of NATO's attack, and you can see in the Barents Sea and the Kara Sea where the Soviet ballistic missile submarines would have made an attempt to escape under the permanent ice cap. Although they would have been protected from NATO aerial attack, they would have been vulnerable to NATO submarine attack. Now the Soviets deployed their ballistic missile submarines, typically four in the Atlantic as well as the Pacific. And they started their deployments of the larger boats starting in 1970 off the U.S. coast. This shifted to bastion control when longer range missiles became available. Because Soviet missiles before could not reach to the U.S. unless they were deployed in the Atlantic. Typically 15 to 25 percent of Soviet ballistic, missiles, uh, ballistic missile submarines were on patrol, which is a much lower number than what the Americans had. This is the bastion in the Sea of Okhotsk. What's important to note here is that Kuril Islands have bases on them that provide protection. So it's quite difficult here for NATO submarines to get into the Sea of Okhotsk to, say, to, to hunt down the ballistic missile submarines. This is a closer graphic of the GIUK gap. GIUK stands for Greenland, Iceland, and UK. In many fictional accounts of how the Soviets would have attacked, it was speculated, including by Tom Clancy, that the Soviets would have deployed airborne soldiers and marines to capture Iceland, thereby cutting some of the SOSIS uh, information from the underlying, uh, under, underwater microphones and forcing NATO then, to then recapture the island.
Now, please proceed to the video of the Harpoon tutorial, which is the program you're going to use to do the assignment, the Naval Warfare Assignment.